Well, if they haven't yet, we have a, uh, we <laughs> we're going to be hunting Easter eggs after the service, actually, um, now that we got all the, the kids inside, either over there or in here, and uh, then we're going to have a, uh, a few secret Easter bunnies that will be hiding eggs in the, the playground out there. So that's going to be after the service. A couple of things after the service. We also have a little giveaway on our flyers. If you got a flyer and, uh, and you showed up here, good morning to you. Welcome to Refuge Long Beach. Um, Mike pointed out that uh, not everybody got the, the number. We had a little giveaway um, in, uh, on the flyer. So in case you actually want to be part of that giveaway, um, it, was, uh, it was just simple text, something fun to do for Easter. And we have cakes from non- Nothing Bunt Cakes that I think were given to us which is awesome. But, uh, but just in case you didn't get in on that, uh, I asked Mike to uh, announce what the number is because we realized we didn't do that. So uh, <laughs> cross the stage over there. Say good morning to Mike. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Mike. Mike. Good morning to Mike. All Mike right. on the this mic. Is, this is cool. I get, to, I get to give you permission to take your cell phones out in church. So if you have your cell phone, bust it out. Don't worry, you're not going to get in trouble this time. All right. But when we're done with this, you got to put it away. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, we meant to put the slide up that says, you know, text egg to this number for a chance to win a special surprise. And so if you're ready, everybody got your cell phone now, hold it up. All right, the number is 562-553-0005. I'll say it one more time. You text egg, text the word egg, E-G-G, to 562 562- Five five three zero 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 five. When you got it, say amen. Amen. <laughs> yes, amen. five six two area code. <laughs> five six deuce five five tray zero 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 five. <laughs> and text the word egg. <laughs> All right, and good luck. It took me the, me the best okay, man thanks, or Mike. woman win. Zero 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 five. Zero zero, zero zero, <laughs> zero 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 zero. Yeah. Zero, what zero, do you think for I'm trying to mess them up because I want to win. <laughs> <laughs> hey, good morning, welcome. If you're curious, we don't do stuff like that every week. We're just having a little fun this week because we know we have some uh, some guests. <laughs> and uh, so uh, go ahead and send that in, and then of course you got to put your phone away. You get in trouble, unless your Bible's on your phone, in which case it's okay. And, uh, and speaking of which, if, uh, if you have a Bible, open up to the book of Luke. If you don't have a Bible, we have a few extra up here. And uh, if you want to grab one, you feel free to grab one. Or Mike and Mike will bring one to you. So if you need a Bible, you can raise your hand and, uh, and we'll bring that to you. And oh, I almost forgot. That's right. I did forget. Okay, so... We, Mike just reminded me, I, I forget to take the offering. And uh, so, so I, I tell you what, we're going to have a shorter service. Since this is Easter morning and we have a lot of guests here, we normally take an offering on, uh, on Sunday morning, but we'll do this morning. If you have an offering to give, we have an offering box in the back on the way out. So give your offering there. If you are new, if you're just visiting, then there is never any pressure to give. This, this service is a gift for you. So uh, this morning, we're not going to pass the bucket, so there's no pressure to give. It is important the church needs the, the, the giving and is important as a part of your walk with God to give. So don't forget on your way out to, uh, to go ahead and, and, uh, and drop your offering in the bucket. But if you're new here, then this is all a, uh, a gift for you. Uh, turn your way to Luke 24. And, uh, and while you're headed there, I'm going to test to see how, uh, how well you know your, your church protocol on Easter morning. When I say, he is risen, you say? He is risen. he is risen indeed. In the church I grew up at, on Easter morning, in the bulletin, it would say, there's the, the line that the pastor says from the front, he is risen, and then everybody else says, he is risen indeed. Now, I have to tell you, that's one of my favorite things on Easter morning, but when I was growing up in church, it was, uh, was kind of like this thing that you just did, you know, it was like, you know, reading poetry in school or something like that. Didn't really mean a whole lot to me. And, uh, and the person up front would say, he is risen, and then we'd all say, he is risen indeed. And that was that. It was just the thing you said. I didn't think about it. It didn't have any meaning to me. I didn't connect it with the fact that Jesus is alive, that he rose from the dead, that he conquered death. 
But I have to tell you, the, the first year I, I became a Christian, I grew up going to church, but it didn't mean a whole lot to me. I gave my life to Jesus and became a Christian when I was about 21 years old. My first Easter Sunday morning. I remember going to church my first Easter Sunday morning as a Christian, as a believer. And I was just waiting for the guy at the front to say he is risen. Because all of a sudden, it was something very exciting for me. And <laughs> I, was, I was sitting in church and I was looking around like, all right, I, I can't preach yet. And I know there's a whole lot of people around me who don't get this yet, so I'm going to say it like I mean it. And so when they, said he, when, the, when they said from the front, he is risen, I was ready. I got one word I get to say in church. He is risen indeed. And everybody else, like, he is risen indeed. And I was looking around like, what is wrong with you people? You can't say he is risen indeed like we're a bunch of zombies. Like we're just in here. I mean, if we're going to say, and so a few years later, I, was, uh, I got invited to, it was sunrise service. We did sunrise service, 6 o'clock in the morning. And, uh, and I was actually invited to be the guy who stands up front and says, he is risen. And so I'm like, all right, I'm going to do this. If I'm going to do he is risen, I'm going to wake the dead with he is risen. Because that's what we do. Isn't that what it's about? Easter sunrise, Easter morning, we wake the dead. God woke the dead. He brought Jesus back to life. And Jesus wakes the dead in us. He rises us again. This is a big day. So I'll say it one more time, and you got to say it like you mean it. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. I might test you again later. Okay, let's turn to Luke 24. By the way, if you have kids, we have, uh, they are welcome to stay in here. This is, after all, a, uh, a kids' auditorium, so the kids are t totally welcome in here. If you want your kids to, uh, to go enjoy our awesome kids' service, we really have a, uh, a fantastic kids' service put together today, so you are welcome right now if you'd like to, uh, to take the kids out this way, and they can go join the kids' service. If you want to stay together as a family, that is totally cool. But let's read together Luke 24, Luke 24. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. When they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We invite you to teach us this morning. Lord, give us understanding, give us insight into the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lord, speak to us from the power of your word. Father, we, uh, we thank you for calling us together. We thank you for, for bringing us together, the family that comes together on Easter Sunday, on Resurrection Day. It's truly a joyful morning. Lord, let us declare to this world that Jesus is risen indeed. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning, we're going to talk a little bit about timing. The disciples showed up three days after Jesus had died. This was a hard time for the disciples. They were confused. They weren't expecting Jesus to die, which is a little funny because we read in our text right here that Jesus had told them explicitly, he told them very clearly that he was going to to suffer, that he was going to die and that he was going to be risen again on the third day. Jesus even had the timing down for them, but for some reason it didn't click. Have you ever had something that you were told but it didn't click? Sometimes that happens with my kids. I tell them very clearly, we're going to get in the car, we're going to go, but something just gets missed along the way. Well, that happened for the disciples. They didn't get it. They were confused when Jesus died and they had run for it, but they came back and on the morning of, on Sunday morning, the third day, they show up at the tomb. And Jesus is not there. His body is not there. But look back at Luke 24 at verse 4. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, 
The women, it was the women who showed up first. The women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. To which you say, I told you I was going to get it again. You got to be ready for that. Okay, we'll try it again. They told her, they said, he is not here. He has risen. There you go. Say it like you mean it. The the two angels show up. Now, Jesus, at this point, was nowhere to be found. Now, he's found a a little bit later by Mary. But at this point, they they go into the tomb. They see the the grave clothes there, but they can't find Jesus. But two angels are there, gleaming like lightning. And they say, I love this line. They say, why do you seek the living among the dead? If you're looking for Jesus, why would you look in a tomb? You should have known he was going to be alive. And the same thing goes for us. I think sometimes we come to church as if we're here at a memorial service, as if we come to a dead savior. We come to to a somber ceremony to to gather together and and sort of say, yes, he's risen indeed. Good deal. And we sing our songs quietly and we go about our business the rest of the week. Coming to Jesus is not coming to a memorial service. We come to a living and risen savior. And the angels challenge the women, why do you seek the living among the dead? This isn't the place that you're going to find Jesus. You're going to find him among the living. They had bad timing. They showed up on the, if they were looking for the dead, they should have showed up the day before. Timing is important in life. Timing changes everything. Timing is is key whether it comes to music. If you have bad timing, you're not going to be much of a musician. The rest of the band isn't going to like you. Timing is important in comedy. You tell the right joke at the wrong time and nobody laughs. Sort of like right there. That was a good example. <laughs> Mike laughed for me. <laughs> Timing is important whether you're gardening or farming. Timing is important when you travel where you're going to go. Timing is especially important in friendship. I would say that you can tell who your real friends are. It's all a matter of Timing. I have a riddle for you. My riddle for you is how can you tell? Oh, no. My riddle for you is this. What time do real friends show up? What time do your real friends show up? (laughs) At dinner time? Is it at dinner time your real friends show up? What time do your real friends show up? I would say in the hard times. Good friends show up in good times. And that's nice. But true friends show up in the hard times. That's how you know who your real friends are. I'm a Laker fan, still. (laughs) See, I've been a Laker fan since 1985. In 1985, I became a Laker. In 1985, it was easy to be a Laker fan. I became a Laker fan in Showtime. Magic Johnson, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, James Worthy. I was a Laker fan when it was the easiest thing in the world to be a Laker fan. It was the greatest basketball team in all time, if you ask me. Being a Laker fan now is a little hard. Boston was not the greatest team of all time. (laughs) Now, the the thing is, I'm not really that big. I was a huge fan, but if I was a true fan, I would be watching the Lakers now. Although, I don't think they're playing anymore right now because it's postseason and it's kind of over. But the Clippers, now here's a true fan. A true fan is somebody who's been a Clippers fan since 1985. There's a lot of Clippers fans right now because they're, they're in the playoffs right now. But a true, clip, a true fan is, if you follow the Clippers since 1985, man, I honor you. You are a real friend. You can tell who your real friends are by those that stick with you. Proverbs 17, 17 says this. It says, a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born from adversity. A friend loves at all times. In the good times, yes, but also in the hard times. Lottery winners share, share that they really have a hard time. Winning the lottery is, uh, is a hard thing for most people. Most of them go bankrupt in, uh, in the United States. Most lottery winners go bankrupt. But worse than that, lottery winners share, a study was done on them, that they lose all their friends. Actually, what happens is they don't know who their real friends are anymore. Because when everything is good, everybody's your friend. And then when everything goes bad, most of them, like I said, lose all their money, suddenly their friends disappear. Winning the lottery causes more harm than good to most people. 
But how do you know where your real friends are? Save your place in Luke 24. We're going to go back there, but I want to show you something in Romans chapter 5. It's a little bit to the right in your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, you can just listen along. I'll read it for you. But if you're following along your Bible, save the place. We'll be back in Luke. But look in Romans 5. And while we go there, I want to ask you two questions. First, how do you know if Jesus is a true friend? How do you know if Jesus is a true friend to you? My second question How does Jesus know who his real friends are? How does Jesus know? How does God in the flesh know who his real friends are? Well, in Romans chapter 5 at verse 6, in Romans chapter 5 at verse 6, if you're there, read with me. If not, I'll read for you. Romans 5, 6, you see at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Paul says there in Romans, at just the right time, Jesus died. At just the right time. It's all about timing. How do you know if Jesus is a true friend? When did he die for you? Did Jesus die for you when you cleaned your act up? When you came, got yourself together, decided to fix yourself up, put all the bad things away in your life, and then show up at church? And then he said, okay, now I'll die for you. No, it says at just the right time, when we were powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. The radical thing about Jesus that you have to understand, the thing that wakes me up on Sunday morning on Easter and makes me say, He is risen indeed. My cat woke me up at 3.30 this morning. 3.30 this morning. (laughs) My cat went nuts at 3.30. I don't know what it was. I think my cat was excited about Easter even more than I was. But at 3.30 this morning, I was groggy in bed. My cat was meowing it up. And as soon as it, cat, quiet, gave the cat some food. My cat's weird. The food's in the dish, and I have to stir it up. I don't have to put more food. I just have to stir it up. It's like, okay, I'm good. I'll eat it now. As long as he hears the noise of the food. So he's good. So I'm like doing that, and then it suddenly hits me. It's Easter. And I, the first thing came to mind, he is risen indeed. Suddenly so it was 3.30 in the morning. I was so happy to wake up. And then I thought, I could just get up right now. And I thought, no, I'll go to sleep. So I went back to sleep. But I woke up again at 4.30 and said, he is risen indeed. I was excited this morning. The amazing thing of, that gets me so excited about Easter Sunday, about Resurrection Day, is that Christ died for the ungodly. That's radical. That Jesus, he, Paul says, you know, there are some people, there might be some people who would die for a good person. For a good person, someone might be willing to die, to lay down their life, to sacrifice and say, you know what, I would, I would give my life for that guy because he's such a great guy. But Jesus saw me at my worst. Jesus saw you at your lowest point and said, I'll die for you now. At your very worst. How do you know who your true friends are? The ones who stick with you in the hard times. How do you know if Jesus is a real friend to you? He was a friend at your worst. He was a friend to me when everybody else should have run away. At my lowest point, he knew your very worst and he died for the ungodly. There's no other savior in the world like that. There's no other religion. There's no other faith like Jesus. Jesus who gave his life for the ungodly. This is the gospel. This is the good news. Jesus died to pay the price for your sins. He didn't die for good people. He didn't die to make you feel better. He didn't die to make you a little bit better. He died to pay for all your sins and start you over so that your sins could die with him on the cross and that you could be a new creation. Do you have any people in your life who stuck with you through everything? I mean, think about that for a second. I know you've been through some hard times. I know I've been through some hard times. I don't know anybody who hasn't been through hard times. But do you have some people in your life that stuck with you no matter what? I've been through a lot. And in ministry, ministry will take you through it. If you want to follow God with your life, and uh, and I hope you do, but it's not an easy road. I've been through a lot. And my family, I can say, stuck with me. We had a... Now, we we hit the mission field, and we've been uh, around. We we went to Mississippi after uh, Hurricane Katrina, and I'm not... When, when somebody's in ministry, it's not about asking for credit or anything like that. It's, it's just following Jesus. 
Jesus is good to me. But there's some hard times involved with it. We had, we had about eight months where we were living out of suitcases and didn't know where we were going to live. But my family stayed with me, and I can honestly say there were times when I really thought that if I had married a lesser woman, then she probably would have left me. My wife stuck with me. My kids stuck with me. They kind of had to. But. but there's something amazing about that. The people that stick with you in your hardest times, you grow the closest with. Remember, I, I shared with you, Proverbs 17 says, a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born from adversity. That's an amazing thing. A friend loves at all times. I think most people would agree with that. A true friend should love at all times. But I love the last part of the verse. A brother is born from adversity. It's the hard times that bring you close. A brother is created out of Somebody who maybe you didn't realize was a brother, you didn't realize was that close to you, but you go through the hard times, that one that sticks with you, you know they're the true friend. Proverbs 18, 24, another proverb says, a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Basically saying, having a lot of friends sometimes will ruin you, like the lottery winner. But there is a friend, there is one true friend who stays closer than a brother. Like it says, he sticks closer than a brother. He stays with you. Jesus is the true friend. He loved me at my worst. And for you, if you'll accept his friendship, which he offers freely, he will never leave you nor forsake you. Now there's a friend. The promise of a friend who says, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. Now, I would say absolutely, Jesus, we can know Jesus is a true friend. But my second question I asked you is a little harder. How does Jesus know who his real friends are? How does he know? I mean, think about this. Jesus, after all, is the son of God. And Jesus is a king. And if you think about it, it's kind of a hard thing for a king to know who his real friends are. Because for a king, things are always good, right? I mean, they're always in charge. Everybody kisses up to the king. He's the big guy. He decides who lives and who dies, and he decides who gets the riches and who gets the good jobs and stuff. So everybody loves the king. So how is Jesus, who is king of kings and lord of lords, supposed to f figure out who his real friends are? What if Jesus had come the way earthly kings come in? Earthly kings usually ride into town riding a big white horse, and presenting themselves a lot of pomp and ceremony. What if Jesus had come that way? What if he was born into a castle with a great kingdom and great riches? Would he know who his real friends are? What if he came with visible glory, with angels declaring everywhere he went, angels went around, behold, the king of kings. He didn't go that way. Jesus came in as a baby born in a, in a stable. He came lowly. Philippians 2.6 says this, Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Jesus, who being in very nature God, his very nature, that was his nature, that's who he is. We are, by very nature, we are human. That's, that's our nature. That's what we are. That's bas our basic essence. We're human. We're made in the likeness of God, but we are not God. Jesus, who being in very nature God, that's who he was. It says he lowered himself. He became a servant, being made in human likeness. Why did he do that? I think part of it was to figure out who his real friends are. And that's a question we all have to ask ourselves. Am I truly a friend of Jesus? Will you stick with him? Now, the Israelites were actually told this in the Old Testament. They were told in Zechariah 9.9, 9, a prophecy of Jesus, see your king comes to you righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Kings came in on great big horses. Jesus came into town on a donkey, not even a big donkey, a little donkey, a baby donkey. I mean, that's as low as you can get. And the Israelites were told this, this is the way you want, you're going to look for your king. Don't look for a worldly king. The king of kings is going to come in on a donkey. He's going to be lowly. And that's a key. Jesus is the king, but he didn't look like a worldly king. Now go back to, to Luke. Go back to Luke chapter 22. 
And the real key of the story, if you follow the, the story of Holy Week, is if you follow, there's a lot of things to, to look at in, uh, in the story where Jesus came riding into town and Jesus answered the, the questions of, of the Pharisees and Jesus' crucifixion, the Last Supper. There's a whole lot of things you can focus on. But if you pay close attention to the story, you'll see one thing that Jesus kept the focus on. And it was about a king and a kingdom. Look at Luke 22. We're going to back up a couple days, a few days, three days before the, the resurrection. We're going to back up to the story the night before he died when he got his disciples together at the Last Supper. Look at Luke 22 at verse 17. Sorry, verse 14. Luke twenty two fourteen. 14. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. He's starting the Last Supper. He's celebrating the Passover with the disciples. And he points out, he brings one thing into focus, the kingdom of God. He says, I've been looking forward to this meal with you. He, he knows that he's going to suffer. He says it very clearly. Somehow the disciples were still surprised by it. But he's, he gets their attention on one thing, the kingdom of God. Look at the next verse. He does it again, verse 17. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again for the, of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. He's talking about the kingdom again. He, uh, he takes communion with them. He, he institutes the, 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 the communion, the Eucharist, if you want to call it that. But then look down at verse 24. Also a dispute arose among them as to which of them was to be considered the greatest. All right, the disciples are having a little argument here. Who's the greatest disciple? Disciples had a little trouble getting the way this works. Jesus comes as a servant riding lowly, and they are trying to figure out who's the greatest in the kingdom. Jesus explains this kingdom doesn't work that way. He says in, uh, in verse 25, Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors, but you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. So Jesus points out, all right, here's how worldly kings live. Worldly kings live to put everybody else down. And I think a lot of people reject God and reject Jesus because they think of him in worldly terms. They think of him as a worldly king who just wants to rule over your life and tell you what to do. But Jesus came as a king who's a servant. He came to serve. He came for you. He died on a cross not for his own sake, but for the sake of others. And he explains, if you're going to follow him, then you're going to be a servant too. And it's not about being the greatest. And then he says this in verse 28. He explains who he is first, that he is the king who's a servant, but then he says to the disciples, this is who you are. You are those who have stood by me in my trials. You are those who have stood by me in my trials. I think that's one of the sweetest things that Jesus said. I must have read this story a hundred times before I picked up that verse, and suddenly it stood out one day. You are those who stood by me in my trials. You know, funny thing is, I think it, it didn't stick out to me until I was in a really hard trial myself. What was Jesus saying to his disciples? You are those who stood by me in my trials. He's saying, you guys stuck with me. Remember in Jesus' life, a lot of people came after him, especially when the miracles came, particularly when the miracle was food. When the food showed up, there was bread, people showed up. Jesus, Jesus crossed the lake to get away. The people got the bread, showed up again. They're back. We got food yesterday. We figured you could do it again today. Somebody find some bread. Doesn't take much. Just find a couple of loaves. We're good. But those same people left. A lot of people showed up when he was entering in his king. Remember Sunday morning, Palm Sunday? Everybody shows up. Hosanna. You know what Hosanna means? Save now. They showed up when they thought, well, the, the king is here. It's the promised Messiah, the savior. We're told he's a savior. Save now. They say, fix my problems now. Somebody, some of them are probably holding up their bills. I need to pay the rent. Heal this. 
People love the miracles, and Jesus does perform miracles. He did, and he healed people that needed it. But at some point, he had to separate in the crowd those that were coming for the bread or the miracles or the healing and those that came truly to honor him as king. And so on Sunday morning, Palm Sunday, after everybody praised him as king, now things are getting serious. It's a few days later now. Jesus is going to die. And he says to the disciples the night before, he said, you guys stuck with me. You are those who stayed with me through my trials. And then what does he say to them? Next verse, 29. And I confer on you a kingdom, just as my father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. He says, I confer on you a kingdom. Jesus shares his kingdom. He didn't come just to set up his own thing and everybody serve me. He came to serve. He came to share his kingdom. Well, who does he want to share his kingdom with? His friends. Those that stuck with him. Who would you share a kingdom with? If you suddenly won the lottery, if you suddenly hit, hit it big, who would you share with? Would you share with the guys who you hadn't seen in 20 years but suddenly came knocking on your door when they saw your face on the news? Or would you share it with the ones who stuck with you at your lowest times? Jesus says, you guys stuck with me at my lowest. I give you the kingdom. And then he does something interesting. Look at verse uh, 31. Simon, Simon. He's talking to Peter here. Simon Peter. Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, Strengthen your brothers. All right, this is pretty interesting. He just told them, you guys stuck with me, but he also knows they're all going to run for it. If you know the story, just a few hours later, all these disciples who were just told, you guys stuck with me, they're all going to get scared. When the Roman guard shows up, a Roman battalion of 600 men with swords, and these guys are fishermen, when they show up, all the disciples scatter. But he tells Peter ahead of time, he tells Peter, you're going to leave. You're going to give up. Peter is like, I wouldn't give up. I'd stick with you to the death. Even if I have to die, he tells Peter, no, you're not as strong as you think you are. You're going to run. But he tells him in advance, when you come back. Man, that's so encouraging. Because I could give this message this morning and tell you, hey, if you stick with Jesus, he'll give you the kingdom. You're like, all right. But you're going to hit a low point. There comes a time in your life, and maybe you already hit it, where you turn away when things get hard. But Jesus, true friend that he is, doesn't give up on you. Even if we are faithless, he is still faithful. Even when we turn away, even Peter at his lowest point, when the rooster crowed, when he had denied Jesus three times, I don't know him, I don't know him. Even when you say, I'm not a Christian, I don't know what you're talking about. And you know Jesus is saved. You know he gave his life for you and you dedicated your life to him, but you walk away from it. Jesus said, you'll walk away and you'll turn back. He says to Peter, when you turn back, Get your brothers back too. Strengthen your brothers. Now there's a friend. A friend who even knows at your low point, at your lowest point, when you give up on him, he still doesn't give up on you. That's our Savior. Jesus does go to trial. He's arrested. Look at the arrest. Look down at verse 32. uh, Sorry, 52. 22, 52. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers and the temple guard, and the elders who came for him, am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me, but this is your hour when darkness reigns. Jesus has gone to the Garden of Gethsemane at this point. He has prayed, and he knows he's going to be arrested. The disciples fell asleep. He told them to stay awake and pray, and they couldn't do it. And then Judas shows up. Judas, who's turned against him, the untruest of friends. Judas betrays him with a kiss. And with Judas is a battalion of 600 Roman soldiers and the the chief priests who have paid Judas off to turn Jesus in. And Jesus says to them, you could have arrested me any time. I was out in the open. I didn't do anything in secret. Why, Why are you arresting me now? Why does it have to be secret? Why does it have to be in the middle of the night, in the dark? 
and he explains to them why. He's not asking a question he doesn't know the answer to. He wants them to know the answer. He says, this is your hour when darkness reigns. Remember, we're talking about a kingdom. He says, this is the hour of your kingdom when darkness rules. You got to understand, there comes a time in your life, in this world, when darkness reigns. That's the time when you figure out who your king is and what your kingdom will be forever. See, this world, the Bible explains, is not run by God at this point. Yes, God created it, but God gave it over. When sin came into the world, God gave it over to the hands of Satan. Satan is called the ruler of this world. Why would God do that? I think it's, again, so God could figure out who his real friends are. If God's always running everything and it's very clear, then everybody, oh, yeah, I'm with God. But when the devil's in charge and darkness reigns, God knows who his real friends are. And so Jesus says, this is your hour when darkness reigns. He is arrested. He goes on trial. Skip down to verse 66 of chapter 22. At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and teachers of the law, met together, and Jesus was led before them. 67. If you are the Christ, they said, tell us. Jesus answered, if I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I ask you, you would not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. They all asked, are you then the Son of God? He replied, you are right in saying that I am. It's an interesting thing. If you follow the story of the trials, Jesus is on trial several times. He goes before uh, the chief priest. He goes before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. He goes before Herod, one of the, uh, the Roman kings. He goes back to Pilate. In all of his trials, the Bible says he doesn't talk very much. He's accused of all kinds of crazy stuff. People come with different stories. The priests pay them off to, uh, to tell different stories about Jesus. None of them add up. Pilate says, you can't, you're not proving any of this. And Jesus won't even respond to any of it except for one thing. If you pay attention, Jesus only says a few words. The one time when he'll speak up is when he's asked about who he is. That's the one thing Jesus wants you to pay attention to here. So ignore all the accusations. They don't stand up anyway. But one thing he responds to, when they ask him, if you are the Christ, tell us, he speaks up. He says, if I told you, you wouldn't listen anyway. And they say, well, are you the son of God? He said, yes. It's just as you said. He said, you got it. You nailed it. This is the son of God you're dealing with. Same thing happens with, with Pilate. Look down at, uh, at chapter 23, verse 1. Then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Christ, a king. He claims to be a king. So in verse 3, so Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. The one thing he'll respond to with Pilate, he's the king of the Jews. Now, why is that so important? Why is it all about who he is? It's always been about who Jesus is. If you pay attention through the Gospels, Jesus did not come to just proclaim a truth, an idea for you to believe. He didn't come with a philosophy. He didn't come to, to tell you, and this morning I don't come to tell you about Christian philosophy and how to be a good person. I come to proclaim Jesus and who he is. If you remember from the very beginning when Jesus was born, it was always about who he is. The angels came and proclaimed, a savior is born to you. He is Christ the Lord. It's about who he is. When Jesus founded his church, remember he asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? Or he said, who do people say that? Well, people say all kinds of things about you. They say that, that you're a prophet. They say you're Elijah back from the dead. They say you're John the Baptist. I don't know how that works. But he said, well, who do you say that I am? That's the question that you have to answer. Who do you say that Jesus is? What did Peter say? You're Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, on this, I will build my church. He builds his church on who he is. Jesus himself is the foundation, is the cornerstone. So when Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? He said, you got it. He's the king of the Jews. Now, what does that mean to you? At some point, you have to decide who is your king. Everybody has a king. We all serve someone. Whether your king is yourself, it's your own ego. Whether your king is pleasure. Whether your king is your job, success. 
the drugs, the stuff. Everybody has a king. Everybody serves someone. In the Old Testament, Joshua said, choose this day whom you will serve. Everybody at some point in life has to make a decision who you're going to serve. Who is your king? Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But you're given a choice. God does not force submission. He does not force you to serve him as king. He gives you the option. He doesn't show up as a mighty king. So everybody says, well, of course, that guy, I have to all get in trouble. He lets darkness reign for a while so that you can make an honest choice and decide who you're going to serve. Pilate sends Jesus to the cross, and on the cross, he hangs a sign over his head. Roman crucifixions were given, and when, uh, when someone was crucified, they would put it out on a main highway. They didn't hide them. That wasn't a, uh, a death in a corner. They put it out on the main highway. They'd hang up the crosses, and over the, the, the cross, over the head of, of each criminal, they would put the, uh, the accusation for which he was condemned. This is the crime. Next to Jesus would have been a man with a, a sign that said thief over his head. Basically, he said to the whole world, don't steal. You steal in our kingdom, this is Rome. You die. On the other side, there was another with a sign over his head that said thief. But you know what the sign over Jesus said? It said king of the Jews. It said it in three languages, in Latin and Greek and in Hebrew, so that everybody would know the reason he died is for who he is. They were killing the king of the Jews, the king of God's people. That's who the Jews were. Look in chapter 23 at verse 36. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurried, hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said? Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Interesting, the reaction of Jesus on the cross. Here is a king who looks the least like a king possible. He is hung up on a cross. Basically, the Romans saying that when, when you hang up a king, you're basically saying your kingdom is done. This kingdom was conquered. And the Romans were saying that to the Jews. Here's your king. He's crucified. And the response to him, some of the guards said, aren't you a king? If you're a king, save yourself. The other, one of the, the thieves said to him, aren't you the Christ? You're supposed to be a savior, right? Some kind of savior. You can't even save yourself. But the one thief looked at him, saw the sign above his head that said king, and he said, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. He looked past the Jesus on the cross that he saw in front of him. He looked past that. He had probably heard Jesus teaching at some point. And here's a guy on a cross. Didn't deserve it. He's at his lowest point, at his worst. But somehow he gets it. He gets that Jesus loved him at his worst. When he was caught in the midst of his sin, he gets it. And he says, Jesus, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? He looks past the king on the cross and he sees a risen savior. He knows he's coming back. The thief got it. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. At some point, every one of us has to decide who we serve in this life. And the reality is that the king that you serve in this life determines the kingdom where you will spend eternity. You choose your king in this life, you get your kingdom for eternity. You choose to serve yourself as king and that's the way you want to live your life, you have that freedom. It is God-given. I will not take it away from you. If God respects you enough to let you choose your own faith, I respect you just the same. But understand that the king you serve in this life determines the kingdom that you inherit forever. Those who choose Jesus as their king at the time when Jesus is at his lowest, Jesus doesn't look like the king right now, even still. Yeah, he came back, but you notice Jesus didn't come back from the dead and appear to everyone. He didn't go around town saying, hey, I'm the king now. He waited. He appeared to those who had already decided he was their king. He didn't want to force himself on anybody else who had rejected him. 
How do you choose your king? How does Jesus know who his true friends are? When Jesus comes back from the dead in chapter 24, where we started out, when the women are looking for the living among the dead, Jesus does come back. And when he comes back, what does he say to the disciples? He appears in the end of Luke. Look in Luke chapter 24. He appears at the end of Luke. At verse 13, now on the same day, two of them were going up to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there, there in these days? What things, he asked, about Jesus of Nazareth? That is a great little story that happens on Resurrection Day. There's a couple of disciples walking down the road, and a man walks up. They don't recognize him. It's Jesus himself, but they don't get that. It still hasn't clicked for them. And they... He says, so what are you guys talking about? And they start talking about Jesus. And Jesus, unbeknownst to them, starts explaining how the whole thing works. He walks through the whole Old Testament with them and explains how everything had to happen this way, that it was all prophesied in the Old Testament. And it's incredible if you read through the Old Testament, that it had to go down like this. He had to suffer. He had to pay for our sins. And he had to rise again. They sit down to eat with him. And suddenly they recognize him and Jesus disappears. And they go running off to the other disciples and say, we saw him, we saw him. And the other disciples are in Jerusalem like, well, some of us saw him too, but one guy didn't see him. You know who that was? It was Thomas. Thomas who hadn't seen them. Thomas says, he shows up later after Jesus comes and goes, I'm not going to listen to you. Doubting Thomas, he's called. I'm not going to believe it. I like Thomas. Thomas has trouble believing what he can't see. I can relate to Thomas. Thomas has a hard time with it. When Jesus, the night before, at the Last Supper, when Jesus had said, you know the way to where I'm going, Thomas stopped and said, we don't know the way to where you're going. How do we get there? And Jesus said to him, I am the way. Thomas, who when the disciples said, we saw Jesus, he's alive. He said, no, he's not. He's not alive. I need to see him. Jesus shows up and he says, Thomas, I like Jesus' mercy here. He didn't say, well, if Thomas isn't going to believe, I'm not going to show up. He's not like that. He helps him out. Thomas had already stuck with him through some hard times. He said, I'll show up. He says, look at my hands. See the hole in my, the, the piercing in my side. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God. He says, my Lord and my God. Thomas gets who he is. He gets it. And he gets that Jesus stuck with him. Thomas, doubting Thomas, we call him. Thomas became an incredible missionary. Took the gospel to the rest of the world. Now, the question is for us, will we stick with Jesus? You know the footprint story? You know the old footprint story? I walked along. I looked back after I died. I looked back at my life, and I saw there was my life. I was walking along. There's two sets of footprints. Jesus was walking with me. But then when there was one set of footprints, I said, hey, how come you left me? Those are the hardest times of my, my life. How come you left me? What did Jesus say? That's when I carried you. I like that story. It's sappy, but I like it. But I think it's a little incomplete. Because I think if, Jesus, if we told the whole story, that it wouldn't just be me walking along with Jesus, and then it was hard, and he carried me. I think that if I were to look back at my life, I'd say, hey, what are those footprints going off that way? Jesus say, that's when you ran for it, you idiot. <laughs> what are you doing? Oh, but look, I came back. Yeah, you came back. Oh, and look, there, there's, there's an angel in the sand. Is that when you sent an angel? No, no, you flopped over. You started kicking and screaming, and you're just like, oh, I can't take it anymore. I think that would be the footprint story of my life. <laughs> but Jesus is faithful. You know his final words before he went up after the resurrection at the end of Matthew? You know what he said? His very last words, the last words of the Great Commission, before he went up in the ascension, he said, behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now there's a true friend. Behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus is the friend who sticks closer than a brother. He is the truest of friends. He's the one who died for us at our very worst. While we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. 
I want to let you guys, we're going to go hunt some Easter eggs. The kids are going to hunt some Easter eggs here in just a moment. But before I let you back out there, and I know everybody's got family to go see, I want to give you a challenge. Are you a friend of Jesus? He's a friend of yours. He makes his friendship available for free. He offers his friendship freely. He died for us while we were sinners. You don't have to get yourself right to come to him. But he gives the invitation to everyone. I want to give the invitation to you this morning. Choose your king. The king you serve in this life will determine the kingdom where you spend eternity. You have an opportunity. And I don't mean to say, oh yeah, Jesus is risen. I can say it good and loud. He is risen indeed. That's good. I'm not talking about just your words. I'm talking about your life. Does your life show a risen savior? Does your life show waking the dead? When I say he is risen, Oh, that's, I wasn't even planning that. Somebody's on top of it. <laughs> when I say he is risen, I want to wake the dead. Listen to this verse from Ephesians. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up, but I want to read this verse to you from Ephesians 5. Paul says this. He says, wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine upon you. Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead. Now, the interesting thing about that verse, I read that, and I think he's talking to unbelievers. He's talking to people who don't know him yet. To those who don't know him, I'm... To the spiritually dead. Before we know Christ, we're dead. And he says, wake up, O sleeper. But the interesting thing is, Paul wrote that verse to Christians who were living as if they were still dead. To Christians who were still living in dark. To Christians who said, oh yeah, he's risen indeed. Oh yeah, I'm, I believe in Jesus. But he challenges them. If you believe in Jesus, stop living for the things of the dead. Like the angels said to the women, Why do you seek the living among the dead? And for a Christian, why do you seek life among the dead things of this world? Why do you think we're going to find life in the stuff that we died to? Paul says, wake up. Like my cat this morning at 3.30. (laughs) Wake up, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. If you are living in the darkness, Jesus calls you back to light. So this morning, I want to give you an opportunity. If you've not given your life to Jesus, I want to invite you right now to give your life now and choose your king. If you've already given your life to Jesus, I want to challenge you this morning to live like he's the king, to wake up from your sleep, rise from the dead, let him shine on your life. I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask if you want to pray with me, if you want to give your heart to Jesus, he's already given his life for you. I want to ask you to pray with me. Everybody, please bow your heads. We'll pray together. If you're not a believer and you don't want anything to do with this, just bow respectfully. But if you want this opportunity to choose your king, I want you to pray after me. Father God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for sending your son to give his life and die on a cross to pay for my sins. I ask you to forgive me. Forgive my sins and take them far away. Make me new. As you raise Jesus from the dead, raise my life from the dead. I choose to serve you as king. In this life, And in kingdom come, and I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer for the first time today, we want to welcome you to Jesus' family. And I want to say one more time before we sing, he is risen. risen All right, if he is risen, we should rise. in the blood of the sun it is finished it is done washed in the blood of the sun he who knew no sin hung on a tree he 
die for me. He who knew no sin hung on a tree. He died for me. It is finished. It is finished. It is done. Washed in the blood of the Son. It is finished. It is done, washed in the blood of the Son. He who knew no sin hung on a tree. He died for me. He who knew no sin, he hung on a tree. Jesus, you died to give us life, eternal life. 